Well, thank you. And um, I thank everyone for showing up today for this Zoom lecture about Sylvan Beach and the Night of Lake history. Um, I'm Jack Henke, obviously. And um, I want to tell you a couple things about myself. I'm a retired social studies teacher. I taught for 37 years at Brookfield Central School. Um, retired in 2011. And um, I'm currently a reference librarian at the New Hartford Public Library. I, um, I stopped teaching and I went into uh, library work, which I enjoy tremendously because a lot of it involves research, etc. cetera. Um, one of my passions is writing and researching local history. Um, I got my start when I was a senior at Hamilton College. Um, I uh, did a study of Sylvan Beach history. I lived in that community for the month of January. We were allowed to do that, to take one course in the month of January. And I researched it. And a few years after, I published my first book, The History of Sylvan, Sylvan Beach. Um, doing this book, um, basically, got sand in my shoes, so to speak. And I um, got into an idol of history in depth. I noticed when I did this book, and when I was first studying in Idle Lake history, that there was a map of the lake that was very common. It was sold in many of the bait and tackle stores up there at that time. Um, the map was done by a gentleman named C.P. Grimes, Charles P. Grimes of Syracuse. He was an engineer, and it contained all these names of points and bays and and towns, etc., that I thought were kind of cool. Names like Potty Gut Bay, um, Lewis Points, um, North Bay, South Bay, um, Old Man's Points, Frenchman's Island, what have you. So my next project about the lake was to research the origin of those names. And um, that culminated in the publication of a book in 1987, A Night of Lake Place Names and History, um, which was just a cool detective story type project. I, I thoroughly enjoyed getting into that. In doing so, I encountered, of course, hundreds of people around the lake, um, many, many primary sources of information, and I started to record stories of the lake. And since 87, I've published a couple books of stories of the lake. I have a copy of one of these books, Tales of Another Lake, um, the other one was published in 2004. Um, it's called From the Beach to Brewerton, a series of tales and essays about the Night of Lake and the Night of Lake history. After I retired from teaching in 2011, um, I became more involved in my church, Zion Lutheran Church in New Hartford. And um, in doing so, I discovered that we were going to we were going to have our 175th anniversary in 2017. And for that, I wrote a couple books about the church's history. One was just an anniversary history. The second was for our 60th anniversary in New Hartford, a new Zion in New Hartford. These were really neat books to do, as were the United Lake books, simply because they involve what I call virgin historical material. Nothing much had been written about it before. So I was starting from scratch. And um, that's a great challenge. You know, when you have to find the facts, find the stories, assembly, assem assemble them, and to um, make them make sense. Basically to recreate and capture the narrative of history. When I was teaching at Brookfield Central School, I tried to involve my children as much as possible in the writing and the research and the creation of history. And um, I was able to, because Brookfield's very small, um, there's just one class of like, for example, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, etc. I was able to use the second semester of the senior year to do oral history projects with my children. And we did 16 of them. Um, we interviewed veterans of World War II, we interviewed veterans of the War on Terror, veterans of the Vietnam War. We did a book about early education in the town of Brookfield. Um, we interviewed people, for example, that had experienced one-room school type education. One of the examples of what we did was this book, um, Flashbacks. We went into the Historical Society, we resurrected a number of photographs, and we researched the history of 
each of the photographs. We brought in a good number of the town's senior citizens to do that research. So that was fun. In any case, let's get to the topic for today, a sampling of Sylvan Beach and the Night of Lake history. Next. Okay. An aerial view of the lake, an outstanding view. We have this in our camp near Lewis Point. The lake's a big lake, and when we understand its geography, we can understand a tremendous amount about its history. And geography influences human behavior, human settlement, human activities. And when you understand that, you, you, you know the why behind a lot of things. The lake is on an east-west axis. East is to the right, west is to the left. The lake is very, very rich in fish, very, very rich in um, other, other creatures. Um, the land on the south shore of the lake is relatively flat, excellent for farming. The land on the north shore of the lake, the soil isn't quite as good, but the, the forests were deeper, they were larger, so it was excellent for lumbering. Geography influences history. Give you an idea of where we are to the right of the map, okay, you will see kind of a, a relatively flat shoreline, that's the east shore. You will see a waterway coming into the uh, lake, roughly halfway down the east shore. That's the Barge Canal at Sylvan Beach. Um, just going to the left or to the west, on the south shore, you can see Lewis Point sticking out. Going all the way down to the west, you can see, okay, you can see, <laughs> You can see the two major islands of the lake. On the left is Frenchman's, on the right is Dunham's Island. You have to take the lake and put it in the context of where it is. Next, please. It's had a very strategic location in New York State. Try to imagine, if you will, a map of the state, maybe a road map, the old road maps that we used to grow up with. Um, Back in the colonial era, if you were going to cross the state from, say, New York City, you were going to go out to the Great Lakes. You'd go up the Hudson, you'd, you'd, you know, portage to Schenectady, get in the Mohawk, you'd go up the Mohawk to Rome. You can see Fort Stanwix right here on the right side of the map where Rome is today. You'd portage to Wood Creek, a little creek. You can see it going down into Oneida Lake. You'd go out Oneida Lake, out the Oneida River, up the Oswego River, and then you'd end up in the Great Lakes region. Before the Erie Canal, before railroads, that was the thoroughfare across New York State. Indeed, it was the easiest thoroughfare for settlers to get from the East Coast through the Appalachian mountain chain, which was very rugged, which was a huge barrier to settlement, and then out to the west. So thousands upon thousands of people passed through Oneida Lake. Um, they saw the resources, and eventually they used those resources. Um, next. The British and the French recognized the value of the Oneida Lake region, and they fortified it. Um, the Royal Blockhouse was a fortification at Sylvan Beach, built by the British in 1759. On the other end of the lake, the west end of the lake, at Fort Brewerton, uh, there was another British fortification. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Sylvan Beach, this sign is on the Verona Beach side of Route 13, just as you're going up the bridge that crosses the Barge Canal. These were not big fortifications, they were outposts. The bigger fortifications in the British chain of forts that protected this route were at Oswego and of course at Fort Stanwix in Rome. But these fortifications basically underscore the importance of this area. Next please. After the revolution, it was time for development and the United Lake Re region started to get its first influx of settlers in the 1790s and early 1800s. One of the developers of the um, Oneida Lake region was a gentleman named George Scriba, who purchased these lands between Oneida Lake and Lake Ontario 
in the 1790s. This was known as Scriba Patents. Um, you might recognize the name Scriba in Constantia on the north shore of the lake. There's Scriba Creek. There's the town of Scriba in, I believe, Oswego County. So his name is sort of memorialized in place names today. Unfortunately, for Mr. Scriba's sake, he bought this at the wrong time. The land was still very, very wild. Um, there were hostile natives in the area. When hostilities broke out with the British um, for the War of 1812, the area was just plain dangerous, and the settlers never quite came. Plus, the soil of this area, from the north shore of the lake over to Lake Ontario, was inferior to the southern soils, south of the lake and out into the Finger Lakes region. So farmers tended to settle in those regions instead. But the Scriba Patents illustrates the sort of development that New York got in the post-American Revolution era. Um, many people in this era came from New England. Um, we used to call this the Yankee invasion of New York State. Thousands upon thousands of them came from the very, very hard scrabble farms that they had in the New England area, and they settled throughout New York. Um, you can see their influence today. Um, think about the number of towns in our area, for example, that have village greens in the center of the towns. Okay, next. Um, the Erie Canal was completed in 1825. It bypassed Oneida Lake. You can see the lake roughly in the center of the map here. You can see that the Erie went south of it. There were two shorter canals that connected to the, um, the Erie Canal with the lake. The first Oneida Lake Canal went from Higginsville to roughly the Sylvan Beach area. It was built in 1837. And the second Oneida Lake Canal was built in 1877. Neither of the canals were particularly popular. Next. However, um, you can see remnants of one of them today. This was the second Oneida Lake Canal that was built between Durhamville and the lake at South Bay. And this is one of the locks of that canal. This lock and a sister lock, which is up by Route 31, are now a part of the Oneida Lake Marina, where I've kept my boat since 1989. It's a gorgeous marina, and it's a very historic marina. Um, it's kind of neat to, as I pass, you know, to and fro in and out of the marina, to pass these great locks, this these um, remnants of an earlier transportation system. Next. The lake, of course, got reconnected to the state's waterways in 1917, when the Barge Canal, sometimes today called the Erie Canal, back then it was technically called the Erie-Barge Canal, was built. It traversed an island lake. You had tugboats to push or tow the barges. You had motorized barges that made this possible. So again, the lake was a part of this great water trade and transportation route. Um, barges, large barges, haven't used the lake for about the past 25 years or so. It's primarily used for recreational um, boats, etc. Unfortunately, um, it has not been open because of the, the pandemic and oh, various repercussions associated with it. Um, though rumor has it that the uh, buoys, they have some huge buoys that mark the channel of the lake, will be placed in there within the next two weeks and they should be opening it up. Next. I mentioned when I first started <clears throat> that the lake has an amazing food web. Um, it is rich in fish. It is just so rich in fish, it's ridiculous. And it always has been. Um, the fishery has changed. In the early years, there were salmon. There were eels. Today, there are walleyes, bass, yellow perch. Um, biological change has been the rule for Oneida Lake and many bodies of water in the United States. Um, this um, slide here shows torchlight fishing in North America. If we were at Sylvan Beach in the early 1800s, in July and August, you would probably see boats like this 
with the torches at night out in the lake, where fishermen, in some case Native Americans, Oneidas or Onondagas, and um, certainly many of the locals would use these boats with these torches to spear eels. Eels were incredibly, incredibly common in the lake. Next. White settlers, of course, regarded the lake as nature's supermarkets throughout their, their years there, and it seldom disappointed the harvesters. This is a, a neat photo that basically was resurrected from um, destruction by technology. Back in the um, early 1980s, a friend of mine bought an old garage at Sylvan Beach that bordered one of the back sets that enter the Barge Canal, near, near what we used to call Skinner's Harbor. The Oneidas own it today. There's a different name, it might be Snug Harbor, I'm not sure. In any case, in that garage, he found a couple tintypes that had been blackened by soot from a fire. And he asked me if I would like them. I said, sure. Um, this was one of the tintypes. Um, I could tell that it was a group of people with fish, but I was you know, unable to do anything with it until the late 1990s when Photoshop came by. And all of a sudden, I gave it to a friend, this in another picture, and lo and behold, here came this image of anglers with walleyes from the, um, basically the 1890s. This was taken at Lindley's Boat Livery at Sylvan Beach. Um, Obviously, the uh, fishermen back then were not too concerned with game wardens and the limits, if you look at the number of fish there. One of the neat things about this picture is the background. I would like you to look in back of the gentleman in the middle. He's next to the kid. You will see what look like spokes in a fence. But trust me, they were not spokes in a fence. I mentioned to you that eels used to be very, very important in the Nida Lake. They were super important. Um, Brewerton and Caudenoy were the centers of the eel industry. Eel, eels were caught, trapped in eel weirs by the tens of thousands. They were cleaned, they were smoked, they were exported, etc. The skins from the eels were dried and they were dried on frames. And what you're looking at in back of the man in the middle are eel skin frames, probably with skins on them, as the eels were dried. The skins were used by farmers for bullwhips, for cows, horses, etc. Um, the smoked eel um, was a delicacy and it was exported via train to the various cities along the East Coast. As the smoking process um, went on, the oil from the eels, eels are very, very omega-3 rich fish um, with lots and lots of oil. The oil would drip down and this was collected and filtered and bottled. And um, to put it diplomatically, it had a relatively liberating effect on the body, the lower extremities when consumed. Next please. I mentioned the food web and how productive it is. Um, the lake boasts a rich, rich food web. Phytoplankton, that's small plants, algae, aquatic vegetation there at the bottom of the food web. Um, the algae can be very annoying. Some of the blue-green algae that we have today can be um, downright nasty at times. But the algae, which blooms every summer, is consumed by bugs, um, aquatic bugs, daphnia, freshwater shrimp, that sort of thing. The bugs in turn are consumed by minnows. Minnows are consumed by you know, larger fish, etc. cetera. Um, if you look at the next slide, you can see two minnows, those are buckeyes. Um, Emerald shiner is very common in the lake. Them and gizzard shad are probably the most common minnows in the lake and gobies, round gobies, a recent invader. And another consumer of the algae are mussels, zebra mussels, which here you can see clogging up a pipe and uh, quagga mussels. Um, the mussels and the minnows are all very, very important food sources for the upper part of the food chain, the larger fish, etc. 
One interesting side effect of the zebra mussels, um, they're an exotic, they're an invasive species. They came into the lake around 1990 or so. They eat the algae, they filter it. And since the zebra mussels have come in, the lake is a lot clearer than it used to be. Next, please. And this, of course, is the upper level of the food chain. Um, example on the left, the yellow perch. Um, they grow very large in the NIDA because of the uh, population of, um, of minnows and other things in the lower stretches of the chain. And walleyes, the premier game fish of the lake. This is a picture of the spawning run at Scriba Creek by the um, New York State Fish Cultural Station, which is a fancy term for fish hatchery at Constantia. Next. The food web is, is changing. Um, the climate is changing. The fish on the left, cute little fellow, isn't he? Is a burbot. It's a freshwater cod. Anita Lake has a small population of these. You generally speaking catch them in the cold weather, though I caught one fishing for walleyes about three weeks ago. Um, burbot numbers are declining because burbot are dependent on cold weather. They have a reverse metabolism. They spawn in winter. Thus, when it gets warmer, and sometimes we've had some winters in the past 15, 20 years when no ice forms, literally on another lake, the burbot can't spawn as well. The summers are warmer, and this puts a stress on the fish. But they're still there, and they're still kind of a cool fish. On the right is a fish that has disappeared in my lifetime. Cisco's, a night lake whitefish. Um, there was a native Cisco, and there was a type of whitefish in 1907 called the Tullaby that was stocked in the lake, and they thrived. Things were colder back then. Um, you might get three feet of ice that formed in the winter. Um, whitefish need cooler waters. But since the lake has warmed, the whitefish numbers have basically dwindled to nothing. I have not seen a Cisco in a long, long time. Next, please. One of the interesting success stories in the ecology of the lake is the lake sturgeon. This is a picture of my friend Tom Brooking. He's a biologist at the Cornell University Field Station at Shackleton Point. Um, he's a, the head, basically, of the sturgeon restoration program there. In 1995, these fish that once lived in the lake, though never in great numbers, they were restored in larger numbers to the lake. Between 1995 and 2000, the state stocked around 20,000 of these sturgeon, all about 12 inches each in the lake, and they have thrived. They love to eat the zebra mussels, the quagga mussels, and there's plenty of those in the lake. And thus, um, well, last year, for example, um, a fish of over 100 pounds was netted. Thus, this relic of the past is with us today. And they're really, really cool. Anglers catch them occasionally. They have to be thrown back. You can see that bringing one in might be a challenge. This one that Tom's got, you know, was an 88 pounder. I, I mentioned that they've, they've broken a hundred. They're cool. They're just cool. It's nice to see that we can restore a part of the past from a biological sense. You know, it's easy to restore a building, restoring a fish or a living creature is a different matter entirely. Next. I mentioned that there was many travelers to the lake. They noticed its beauty. They noticed its resources. And eventually, in the latter part of the 19th century, they took advantage of them and they built resort communities. One traveler to the lake in the early 1870s was a gentleman named um, Albert Bierstadt, who, um, by the way, married a local gal, Rosalie Osborne from Waterville. Um, he visited and stayed with the Osbournes um, in, I think, 1872 and 1873. Rosalie's um, father, Amos Osborne, took Bierstadt to Sylvan Beach 
and he painted this evening on the Nidal Lake, which is just a gorgeous, gorgeous painting. This would be the mouth of what was then called the Wood River. There was no barge canal in, in 1873. Um, to give you an idea of where Bierstadt was standing when he painted this, the Canal View restaurant is roughly in that spot. Next, please. Next, thank you. Um, this is another picture of the spot where Bierstadt was standing. You can see the point of land here. This was taken probably in the 1880s. Um, there were several piers here for the Algonquin and Leland Hotels of Sylvan Beach. Next. The beach used to be a wild, gorgeous, gorgeous beach. Um, in 1918, a gentleman from uh, the New York State Department of Conservation named Homer House did a study of the vegetation along the east shore of Anita Lake. And in that study, he photographed Sylvan and Verona beaches. This is Verona Beach. If you look closely, um, way, way up, you'll see kind of a solid line going across the picture with three boats down below it. This is the old Sylvan Beach Pier when there was an actual physical pier. Now it's pretty much fallen into the water. House captured the beach in its wild state, when it was big, when there was vegetation growing at it. Um, wait till you see the next slide. Look at the next place. This was Sylvan Beach. I mean, look at it. You've, you've got sand grasses. Yeah, you've got vegetation that only um, grows in like a, a lakeside sand beach sort of environments. Um, you can see in the background, you can see the pier, fishing pier shutting out. It's a little tougher than it was in the other, other slide there. But this just gives you, gives you an idea of what the beach was like. In many places, the beach was 100 yards long, 100 yards wide, excuse me, and many, many miles long. One of the old sayings that they used to have in some of the um, advertisements for Sylvan Beach and the East Shore in the uh, um, late 1800s, early 1900s was, four miles of the finest bathing beach in the world. And it was really, really fine. Next, please. Bordering the beach was the woods, a deep pine and oak forest. Um, you'll see in the caption there that the word Sylvan is in Sylvan Beach, derives its meaning from the Latin word meaning Sylvanus, meaning wooded. It was veritably a wooded beach, a very, very rich biome. Next. And it had to get developed. Um, things had to change. And here you can see one of those changes. Um, this was probably taken around 1920 or so. Um, there was a boardwalk at Sylvan Beach. It stretched from roughly the Barge Canal up to 16th Avenue. You had people, you know, that would promenade along the boardwalk you know, people that were using the beach, etc. Um, kind of a neat thing in this picture. It's a colorized picture, but I think the uh, the artist was fairly true to it. If you look along the shoreline, you'll see various greens. You'll see piles of things, etc. More than likely, these were weeds that had been blown in, maybe algae piles, etc., from the lake. The lake has always had algae blooms. Um, the French in the 1700s used to call another lake Le Lac Vert, the Green Lake. So algae has always been there. It's been noisome. It's been bothersome. Um, it isn't just a contemporary phenomenon. One of the reasons why, and I mentioned this before, that the lake is such a rich ecosystem producing as many fish as it does is the bottom of the food chain is rich. Um, the algae, the bugs, etc. Without that, you'd have something like many of the Adirondack lakes which are not so rich. Next, please. The beach, of course, has changed. <laughs> this is in 2010. Um, there is no boardwalk. There is no beach vegetation. There is jet skis, power boats, and bathers. It's a totally, totally different situation. Next. But you can find the old beach at times. Um, this is my friend Karen. We went for a walk around the year 2000 in late November. The state controls the level of Benita Lake, and they always lower the lake in late November 
early December, um, basically to get the level down there to account for um, flooding in the springtime. They, they want the lake to be able to take care of the, the meltwater basically from Fish Creek, which um, originates up in the um, Tug Hill region and is the lake's number one tributary. When the lake gets lowered, you will often have 100, 150 yards of absolutely gorgeous beach. You don't have the vegetation that Homer House photographed, but you have the size beach that people enjoyed back in the early 1900s. And it is absolutely grand if you have the right day to take a stroll around it and to experience Oneida Lake's ecological history. Next, please. Okay, Sylvan Beach. It developed in the 1880s. Initially, James D. Spencer, this gentleman here, and his sons, Reuben, Lyman, Houghton, and Bruce, and his son-in-law, Fred Randall, invested in real estate and businesses in the village, and the place took off from there. Next. Um, one thing, one hotel they invested in was the Forest Home. Um, if you look at the bridge here, this was the first bridge across what was then Wood River. Now it's the Barge Canal at Sylvan Beach. On the right side of the photo, you'll see a building. That's the Forest Home that was run by the Spencer family. You'll note a steamer here. Steamboats were very important in the early days of the lake. Next, please. There is the Forest Home, Forest Hotel. Um, it burned in the early 1980s, but I'm sure some of you remember it as being um, you know, a going business throughout much of your lives at Sylvan Beach. Next. Um, along with the Forest Ho Hotel, Forest Home, which was built in 1879, the Algonquin, which was built in 1884, was the first um, relatively large hotel, tourist facility at the beach. Um, political conventions were held there. Um, Republican Governor of New York, Roswell P. Flower in 1886, addressed thousands of hop growers at the hop growers picnic that was centered around the Algonquin Hotel. This was located roughly where the Canal View Cafe is today. Next, next. <coughs> Pardon me. The village of Sylvan Beach, indeed all the villages around the Nidal Lake was dependent on good transportation facilities. Um, good transportation methods rather to get there. Um, railroads, very important. And once you got there, steamboats to get around. Before the railroad went into Sylvan Beach, little steamboats like this one met the trains. You can see the bridge here a mile east of the beach at a place called Fish Creek, the hamlet of Fish Creek. Um, tourists would disembark there and take a steamboat ride into the lake. Next. They would land at Sylvan Beach and piers like this. You can see the old bridge in the background. And basically they could walk through the beach, walk to the picnic groves, walk to the various midways, carnival entertainments, etc. Next. And they could stay at hotels. Oh, wow. On the left is the St. Charles Hotel. This was the grandest hotel at Sylvan Beach. By far it was built. In 1899, it was destroyed by fire in 1914. It was built by Louis Cheesebro from Cheesebro Ponds. Louis Cheesebro was a patient of Dr. Martin Cavanaugh, who ran the sanitarium at Sylvan Beach. Louis became very fond of the community. He um, also, while he was a patient, became fond of one of Dr. Cavanaugh's nurses, and he married her and um, established very, very close ties um, with Sylvan Beach at that time. Um, as a testament to his love for the community, he um, built the St. Charles Hotel in 1899. Interesting sidelight here. Louis Cheesebro passed in 1906 of food poisoning. When he passed, Dr. Cavanaugh became one of the leading advocates in our country for reform for legislation to correct poisoning in food. And Kavanaugh was on a state commission 
whose recommendations eventually were passed on to President Theodore Roosevelt and led to the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act. Another hotel on the right was the Hotel Nobles. This was located by the light, the traffic light at Sylvan Beach. I doubt that any of you watching remember it as the Hotel Nobles, but if you look at the next slide, you might remember it as Russell's Hotel and Dance Land. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, Mr. Russell purchased the hotel in 1919, the old nobles. He added on a dance hall in the back, which became home to the big bands in the 1930s and 40s. You can see Jimmy Dorsey and his orchestra was there. Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway was there. Frank Sinatra sang there. This was one of the big, big clubs in central New York. For the Dorsey concert, one of the old timers told me back in 1972, the cars were lined up from Sylvan Beach to the intersection of Route 1331, three miles south. The Dorsey brothers played several concerts. They'd fill the place up. They'd play a concert. There'd be some dancing, then empty it. Then another you know, group of people would come in, thousands upon thousands of people in the village for this. Next, please. I mentioned Dr. Kavanaugh in connection with the Pure Food and Drug Act. This on the left was his sanitarium. It's still there today. Um, and this is Dr. Kavanaugh on the right. A couple of things of note. Um, look at the sanitarium building. Dr. Kavanaugh had unique tastes. He liked the site for the building in 1891. And he liked a craggy old tree that was on the site. So he instructed the people that built the building, his contractors, to build it around the tree. And you can see the tree coming out of the front of the building, on the right part there, coming right out of the roof. Now that's unique. You don't have too many buildings that are built around trees. That tree was still there in 1972. Um, another thing. If you look at the architecture of some of the buildings in both slides, the house or the camp rather to the right of the Kavanaugh Sanitarium and the building in back of Kavanaugh here in the photo on the right, um, you'll note that the architecture was gingerbread Gothic architecture. Sylvan Beach was veritably like much of uh, Martha's Vineyard with the gingerbread houses spread throughout the community. Next please. Kavanaugh was a bit of an artist. Um, he made this collage to depict the beach's activities around 1910 or so. Um, you can see Sylvan Beach and Idle Lake from the Kavanaugh Sanitarium. I used this for a cover for my last book, From the Beach to Burton. It's a cool, cool picture, um, and it depicts a lot of what happened at Sylvan Beach at that time. You can see motor launches, steamboats, people in canoes, bathing beauties with their very, very, how shall we put it, um, ample bathing suits. You can see a photographer on the beach. You can see, well, you can't see it, but there is a fisherman coming in on the right. That got cut off here. A Keystone cop on the left going down the boardwalk. And, and this is kind of cool, a gentleman in the lower right-hand corner here contemplating the scene, sort of like Rodin's The Thinker. That gentleman is Dr. Kavanaugh. Next, please. Amusements have always been big at Sylvan Beach. There were two amusement parks. One is where the Little Midway is today. It was called Carnival Park. Next. Another was south of the bridge, excuse me, east of the bridge. It was called Luna Park. Those were two midways. Next, please. The beach itself was a huge, huge attraction. Um, people wanted to go swimming. Okay, uh, there we go. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, one of the attractions was the toboggan slide that was run by the Rao brothers, who also ran um, and owned a bathhouse on the beach. Um, for the toboggan slide, you can see people walking up the stairs carrying these long toboggans. They then basically rent a toboggan for an hour for a nickel or dime, whatever it was, and they could put the toboggan on the slide excuse me, and then slide right down into the waves of a night lake. I love some of the attire. Um, if you look at it closely, the hats people wore, 
Possibly they had a hairstyle like mine. They had to protect themselves from sunburn. The parasols, again, the bathing suits, what have you. Next, please. Here's a close-up of the slide and of the bathhouse um, at the right, the Rao Brothers Bathhouse. Um, you can still see this bathhouse at Sylvan Beach today, but it doesn't look like this. Um, it was sold in the 1930s. Next, please. It was cut in two, and the back of Laughland, an old funhouse at Sylvan Beach, is the old Rao Brothers bathhouse. If you look closely, you'll see it right there. A nice reuse of a building. Next. I mentioned that railroads were the lifeblood of the beach before the auto proliferated in the 1920s. This is a picture of the railroads, um, main railroad station at Sylvan Beach. This was the Ontario and Western Station, a couple trains moving there. Sometimes trains would bring in excess of 50,000 people to the beach a day, mainly weekends, of course, for the big picnics. Um, the hop growers picnic, um, the trainmen's picnic. Um, there was a picnic, a very popular picnic for um, Central New York's African American population. Um, to give you an idea of where this railroad station was, you'll see um, a little stand here, okay? That's approximately where Eddie's restaurant is today. Probably many of you have been to Eddie's and enjoyed the food, etc. Next. Another way to get to the beach, as I mentioned before, was through steamboats. You had steamboats that ran around Denida Lake from town to town, from port to port. Burton to South Bay to Bridgeport, not, not Bridgeport, to Lakeport, to Lewis Point, to Cleveland Constantia on the North Shore. This was one of those popular steamboats, the Manhattan. It was originally the, um, the Oswego. It was sold and um, made into the Manhattan. In the off-season, these steamboats were used to tow things through the lake. Barges, from the two Oneida Lake canals, and also rafts of logs. Um, logging was a very, very important occupation along the north shore of the lake. Next, please. I mentioned the gingerbread architecture, um, Gothic Revival architecture. These two pictures are just gems that depict that architecture. It was common very common throughout Sylvan Beach. Um, you can see it, you can see it today on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, I just wish they'd been able to keep this. Granted, in our rugged climate here in upstate New York, architecture that has ornamentation, frills, if you will, like these, um, it's, it's tough to maintain it. And certainly back then when they didn't have treated lumber, it would make it doubly tough. In any case, though, look at the details. Look, for example, the photo on the left at the um, semicircle that um, is the border atop the porch here. And look at the various little frills and details throughout the building. Um, these were magnificent summer camps. And the word camp um, became a more luxurious word when you saw them. Next, please. In the 20s and 30s, the east shore of Oneida Lake, Sylvan and Verona Beach, um, became a haven for upstate's working class. Camps were relatively cheap. And many, many buildings were, camps were built in the 20s and in the 30s and the 1940s, the post-war era also. They were small, they were functional. I have a feeling that they replaced a lot of the old gingerbread Gothic type structures that basically couldn't be maintained. Above all, they were affordable. And families that, you know, I knew when I was growing up in Utica could afford to have a camp up at Oneida Lake. Um, today, it's a different ball game. You know, the lake's fairly pricey. But back then, it was um, a blue collar type resort. Next, please. Who would we find at the beach in the lake? Back then, we'd find all kinds of people. <laughs> Volunteer firemen looking kind of tired in a, in a uh, photographic studio, a tin type studio, saying goodbye, Sylvan Beach. Bathing beauties, having a good time in the waves. Next. 
We find nurses posing on a blizzard's aftermath. These were the nurses at the Kavanaugh Sanitarium. Um, Sylvan Beach got dumped on severely in the winter of um, 1913, 1911, excuse me. And um, you can see the, the effects of that, that dumping. We'd see loving couples in postcard studios. I have probably seen several hundred images similar to the one on the right, you know, where people would come into the studio and they'd have their picture put on, on the postcard with, you know, the, um, the, the design on the right accompanying it. That was a souvenir. That was what you brought back to show that you had a really, really good time. Next. You'd find lots of folks who like to document their fun times. If they had a few more bucks, they could have a few pictures taken, have a photographer go with them, and then have a composite made of that experience. You can see these folks, you know, wanted to be photographed, if you start at the upper left-hand corner, by the railroad tracks, by the toboggan slide, again by the railroad tracks down below, by the beach itself with the uh, Rao Brothers bathhouse sticking out, together, all of them, and with a shot of the lake with one of the big steamboats steaming away. A cool composite. Next, please. The beach today is still a cool town. I, I, I still enjoy it. Um, I speak there every um, August, first Sunday, 7 o'clock at Union Chapel. I'm not sure how we're going to do that this year, but it's, it's a thrill to be in a historic building like that, talking about a town that I, I care about very deeply. What's neat is there's, there's still some reminders of Anita Lake's past in the architecture of the beach. Um, the Pancake House was purchased by a family, oh boy, about seven years ago. It's been restored. There are some very neat apartments upstairs. The columns have been restored and the Greek revival nature of this magnificent building, which was originally built in 1913 as a post office, the Greek revival nature has been restored. Next. I mentioned Union Chapel at Sylvan Beach. Um, it was built on land donated by the Spencer family, the founding family in 1887. It's where I speak in every August. It's a cool building. <coughs> <clears throat> it was the site of a movie, The Sterile Cuckoo, started, starring Liza Minnelli, um, that was shot in 1968. Um, it's the scene of many weddings. There's a chapel association that sponsors Sunday services. What's neat about it, and this is kind of tough to tell from this picture, is that the lower part of the walls pop out so that if there's an overflow crowd, People can sit on the side of the building. They could sit in the front of the building. Indeed, they could sit on the beach itself in the back of the building and be a part of the service. Now, that's, that's a unique feature to a building. And um, from the minister's perspective, you, you might consider it to be a very optimistic feature, too. Okay, next. That's the end of my formal talk about Sylvan Beach. Um, I put a few slides in here to acquaint you with my current project. I am working on another book about the Nida Lake. It will be a book of stories about various aspects of the lake's history, neat aspects, fun aspects, um, rich aspects that deserve preservation. I may publish it online simply because as you can imagine, the status of the publishing industry is relatively tenuous, okay? Um, state of much of life is a little bit tenuous. And a website online, say, and I like history.com, would be a good way to perhaps preserve and um, protect these stories so that people have them in the future. One story will be about a Night of Lakes oarsman. And this is a picture that will go with the story. The oarsmen were the old-time fishing guides that used to take sports out onto the lake. They were called oarsmen because they rowed their boats. And you can see some of the rugged wooden boats in the foreground of this picture that they used to use. Now, a little bit of a story to this picture. The um, 
Anglers Association of Onondaga was one of the early sportsmen's organizations around the lake. They held an annual fishing derby. And they hired a number of oarsmen to take them around the lake. Some of the best fishing grounds in the lake, however, are several miles out. So what they used to do was they also hired a steamboat in the background, which would tow the boats in a chain out several miles. They could fish all day and then eventually row to a common spot and get towed back in to Brewerton, in this case, right here. An ingenious way to, um, <laughs> to conquer the fact that you didn't have an awful lot of mobility. Reminds me of a story, um, two of my favorite sources of information, and excellent sources they were, of um, Night of Lake history were Millard and Chuck Rogers, who used to run the Brewerton Bait Shop, later Brewerton Sports, when they were kids growing up in the 1930s in Brewerton, they had a rowboat and they could not afford a motor. So what they used to do in the early morning is row the bo boat out into the barge canal and wait for a barge or a tugboat going east out into the lake. There were many barges and tugs back then and yell at the crew for a tow, ask for a tow. And, um, they had a rope, and if the crew was willing, uh, they'd throw the rope. The crew would tie it to a cleat on the barge or the tugboat and give the boys a tow out into the lake. Um, then, of course, they would roll right back. Um, <laughs> one must be adaptive, and that's certainly an example of that. Next, please. I, I will have a story about the ice industry at Anita Lake. It was a huge industry. This was an ice house on Big Bay. Um, the lake, as I mentioned, I think for an earlier slide, used to um, freeze to a depth of three feet. Ice, of course, was used in ice boxes, which were the uh, predecessors of refrigerators. It was a vital, important industry. Next. I will have a story about ice boats. In the days before snowmobile, if you wanted speed, you had an ice boat. Um, these could go 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. This was taken at the village of Cleveland, two huge sails. You had to have the right ice conditions, but sometimes you would see 50, 70 ice boats like this on the lake. Next. I'll, ha I'll have a story also about this gentleman. Whoa, 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 back then. I'll have a story about this gentleman here on the right um, and his family. There's some background noise from somebody. If you could turn yes. your... Yeah, somebody, your microphone's on. Can everyone please mute your microphone? I can't find who it is. I'm competing. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this gentleman, there'll be a story about because he was just a unique individual. His name was Jacob Jake Kaiser. He lived in our South Bay, Upper South Bay, which is the one near Sylvan Beach. Ran a hotel. Um, he was a farmer, as you can see here. He was with his scythe. He had a general store. He was an oarsman, a fishing guide, and he was a hero because in the days before 911, there were still problems with people getting in trouble capsizing, etc., on the night of lake. And you needed someone who would basically have the courage to row out there and to um, rescue them. Jake rescued dozens of people from the lake when it got rough and there were storms. In fact, one of the rescues made him so famous that he was awarded the Carnegie Medal for courage and patriotism um, for that rescue unique individual. He was also a fish pirate and a game warden, um, which is an interesting contradiction. And my last slide. And Idle Lake is fun. It's tremendous fun. I still have a great time there, not only researching, but in fishing, especially when I've got my favorite fishing partner, my niece, Erin, um, who always outfishes me and who just loves the sports. Um, 
there's a lot of richness to the lake, written, oral, and experienced. And I'll leave you with that thought. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. Rebecca?